a little bit of a smaller class today. I guess uh, I guess you guys are the ones who finished, right? No? Okay. Uh, let's maybe start. Uh, are there any final, absolute, last-minute questions on the project? Yeah. Uh, so the code review, uh, the question is what are, what are we expecting out of the code review? Uh, the code review is basically meant to do three things. Uh, number one, it's meant to give us a sense that everyone on your team is contributing. So we'll be asking questions of your entire team about how the code works. Uh, the, you're not expected to know how every single aspect of your code works, but you should be at least familiar with it familiar enough with it to give a general sense of what the different parts are doing. So we'll be asking you to basically trace through the execution of a, a piece of code uh, of uh, a given query and then making sure that, as I said, you, uh, everyone on the group understands how the code works. Uh, part, the second thing we're trying to do with this is um, Obviously, we're not going to ask you to implement a full query engine that can handle every single aspect of SQL, uh, but we'd like to get a sense that you at least understand how the bigger pieces, uh, how the, the, the query processing engine that you're building uh, could potentially be extended uh, to a, a full engine. So we'll be asking um, if you were to implement feature X, how would you go about doing it? Um, and the last thing is mainly just a sanity check. Um, this is a cumulative project, and the earlier we're able to catch kind of... Uh, dire uh, th there's a, a lot of people uh, in previous years have had issues where they start designing in one direction, um, not being aware of uh, potential repercussions down the line. So the third goal is basically to catch uh, situations where you might be developing something that's uh, in a way that's going to uh, significantly penalize you in later projects. So we can kind of point those out and say, you know, how would you go about developing this? How would you fix it? And so forth. Does that, uh, those are our three main goals. Does that address your question? Anything else? All right, well, um, let me, given that uh, that came up, uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up is that there is a sign-up sheet for the uh, code review um, which will take place this Thursday. Um, there are slots available and uh, basically sign up on Piazza if you haven't already done so. I'm pretty sure just about every group has. So, all right. Um, so last lecture we talked about uh, the design, uh, the physical design of uh, a database system. In other words, how do you actually store the data that you're going to try and retrieve later on? We talked about the memory hierarchy and we talked about a couple of different strategies for laying out your data. Um, sorting them, uh, storing them completely unsorted, uh, storing the records uh, clustered or organized together, uh, and a third option, which was to store pointers to where records live. So today, uh, we also got into, uh, or we started talking about tree-based indexes. And in particular, we talked about one index called the index structured access method. Uh, let me do a quick recap of it uh, through a little bit of an example. Um, so a index structured access method tree uh, stores uh, an organizational structure that sits on top of a, sor a completely sorted file. Um, you have a bunch of blocks of data. Uh, sorry for the contrast. Uh, you have a bunch of blocks of data uh, stored in a sequential file and these blocks of data are stored completely sorted. Um, on top of that, we build a series of index pages where the index pages uh, essentially contain uh, pointers to ranges. So in this example, all records falling between 
key 20 and key 33 would be in the uh, center page of the left side of the tree. Um, so these index pages can say, contain uh, both endpoints for the ranges and pointers, uh, uh, showing where, where to go to find the data that you're looking for. OK, so if you want to do an insertion into an ISAM index, uh, well, you're kind of not going to be able to insert it directly into the file. You're going to have to uh, store what are called overflow pages. And overflow pages kind of uh, sit there next to the actual pages of the, the sorted list and kind of tack on extra things onto, uh, onto, the, the, sorted uh, onto the, the sorted list. And if you want to do any kind of access on anything uh, in that kind of page, you need to access all of those pages, even if they're potentially out of order. Um, and this continues if uh, you create more and more overflow pages uh, as needed. Uh, if you do happen to delete records, then um, you might be able to free up some of these overflow pages but realistically, that doesn't happen quite as often. So ultimately, an ISAM index is basically designed to store, uh, to store sorted, uh, excuse me, an ISAM index is designed primarily to store uh, an organizational structure over data that isn't changing very frequently. Um, it can, there are kind of hacks to get, uh, to add support for changing data, but realistically, uh, data that you're, you're inserting in there is not really going to change very frequently. Now, of course, this, this works for some workloads, but in general, uh, you're, not, you're actually going to want to manipulate data that's stored in a database, which is where uh, a data structure called a B tree or B plus tree comes in. So B plus tree looks very much like an ISAM index. Uh, the only difference here is that the leaf pages are stored as a linked list of pages rather than a big sequential uh, array of pages. They don't necessarily need to be laid out in order on disk. Other than that, it looks very much like an ISAM index. Um, if you want to find uh, for example, uh, five, you'd start at the root and then you'd go to the uh, relevant, the page. In this case, uh, you'd follow the, um, the leftmost pointer because five is less than 13. Uh, 15, between 13 and 17, you'd follow the second left pointer. If we want to do a range scan, well, we need to start with whatever page we'd start with, and then do a linked list traversal over all of the pages on disk. Uh, just to be clear, uh, every page on disk can be assigned a unique identifier. Um, and in fact, it is assigned a unique identifier. Um, so pointers, uh, the analog of pointers in this case is the unique identifier of the page, not necessarily an actual pointer to a chunk of memory, just to be clear. OK. So the gimmick of a B plus tree is not just that you can insert data into the leaves, but that you can actually restructure the, um, the organization on t sitting on top of those leaves. And Ideally, what kind of an organization would we want to see in that tree structure? So think back to algorithms. What kind of trees are, what is a good pattern in a tree, yeah? Right, you want the tree as flat as possible. Uh, as flat and as, you evenly uh, as uniformly distributed uh, or evenly uh, spaced as possible. So in a B tree, whenever you do an insertion, you potentially need to 
uh, you may run out of space. And if you run out of space in a leaf, you potentially need to propagate that change um, up. So best way to illustrate this is through an example. So I have my little index here, and I want to do an insertion. I follow my pointers. Uh, which bucket should I be going to? One on the left. Um, so now I want to do an insertion into that. Let's uh, just quickly zoom into that chunk. Um, do the insertion on that uh, particular page. But now we have a problem. There are, oh, excuse me, going a little too fast. Uh, if I want to do an insertion onto that page, well, let's say that page can only hold four records. If I want to insert an eight into there, I have to split that page in half. So what I'll do is I'll actually do the insertion normally, I'll create a five record thing, and find whichever key happens to be in the middle now. This, I mean, how, how exactly you partition is uh, arbitrary. You just want to find the key that is smack dab in the middle. In this case, that's five. Then you take this, these two page, uh, you need two pages to actually store this. So you're going to take uh, two pages and you're going to put half of the records onto one page, half of the records onto the other. Now here's where the tricky bit comes in. Because now I have two pages and I want to organize both of those pages. I want to have pointers to both of those pages in the parent. So now what I need to do is insert uh, a partition pointer into the parent. Um, I want to have some way of telling that keys less than five go to the left, keys greater than or equal to five uh, go to the right. Unfortunately, I don't actually have enough space to do that because this parent uh, page can only store, again, four records. So what I'll do is exactly the same thing. I'll create a new sorted list with the five in there. I'll find the middle record, and then I'll split the index page into two parts. Note that unlike the uh, pages, the, the actual data pages, I can pull the middle value out uh, because I don't actually need to store anything uh, except for pointers. So I'll create a new, in this case, uh, that was already my root index. So I'll take the, uh, the 17, that'll be a pointer in a new root page, and uh, 5, 13 go on, uh, are less than that, they'll go onto one side, uh, 24 and 30 are bigger, they'll go onto the other side. So, why exactly... Oh, actually, I answered that, didn't I? Um, so, the goal here of a B plus tree is to make sure that the... Uh, that at any given point in time, every single page is at least half full, with the exception of the root page, and that every single... Um, Every single page is at least half full, and, well, obviously it can't be more than completely full. Is that guaranteed to happen in this case, or following this kind of split procedure? Will I ever create a page that is um, less than half full? And if not, how can I prove that to myself? So in this case, we have uh, the, the size of each page is four records. We can't store more than four records in a page. When do we split? When we have five records in a page. So if I split whenever my page is more than full, will I ever get less than, or will the two new pages that I create, will they ever have less than half? No, 
because one's full. Okay. Um, right. So I have these. All right. So basically, anything that I do to this this tree, I need to make sure that that occupancy guarantee is satisfied. I need to make sure that the pages are always at least half full. So what happens if I were to delete a record? Well, I'd need to do something very similar. I'd need to take the records and I'd need to start collapsing them uh, together. So again, let's do a quick example. Let's say I first delete the record 19. That'll take us down to that. Delete the record 20. Well, now that page is less than half empty. It only has one record in it. So I need to, uh, it only has one record in it. Now, if I'm trying to make sure that the tree is nicely balanced, that's not a good thing because there's this one page that has very little data in it. And odds are I could probably do better. So what can I do now? What are my options? Yeah, okay, so I've got this really, really big page over to the right. Why don't I actually just you know, rebalance? Uh, so the simple thing to do would be to copy some stuff over. All right, now if I keep doing that, eventually, and, or excuse me, if I keep deleting things, eventually I'll get to a point where rebalancing isn't good enough, where I could copy from my neighboring pages, but those pages are now sufficiently empty that one of the two pages would end up not, no longer satisfying the, the occupancy guarantee. So what happens now? Merge the two pages. So now that the two pages are less than half, or would be less than half full, um, I can satisfy my, uh, my occupancy guarantee by merging those two pages together. So I will do exactly that. Um, I delete my 22, and now I compact those together. Uh, that now requires me to rearrange my parent page so in this case, the 27, 27 is no longer a partition value because now those two pages have been merged. Uh, so the 30 slides over. All right, are we done? Right, so the 30, uh, that index page with the 30 on it, no longer satisfies the occupancy guarantee. It, we can make this tree more compact and therefore more efficient. So we'll do exactly the same thing as before uh, and merge the 30 with the parent. Uh, once again, the 17 goes down. Uh, all right. The other possibility, and just to set up a slightly different scenario, the other possibility is that uh, we can do something similar to what happened with uh, to we can do uh, another one of these redistribution steps, just not at the root, uh, just not at the uh, the index pages. So what will happen is essentially we do the same thing that we would do when splitting a page or when inserting into a page. Uh, we take the page, the page immediately to its left or right, uh, combine them all together, and then take whatever happens to fall in the middle and make that the new root. All of the other pointers kind of just rotate around that, uh, the, the pointer that, uh, kind of just rotate around uh, the pointer that got moved to the root. Okay. So to summarize, a B plus tree is similar to an ISM index but it has two differences. Number one, the data pages are stored out of order, so they need to be stored in a, link, in a linked list of, of pages. 
And the other difference is that we have these occupancy guarantees that we need to maintain in order to keep the tree balanced. And as long as we keep the page either half full or half empty, it'll stay, uh, sorry, half full or anywhere between half full and completely full, uh, the tree will be roughly balanced. Any questions on tree indexes? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, you need to pick the middle. Do you pick to the left or to the right? Um, doesn't matter. Uh, in this example, 17 or 20 would have been a legitimate uh, new root choice. Any other questions? All right, so let us move on. So tree indexes, uh, what are our expected access times into a tree index? Uh, what's the cost to read in terms of number of IOs to read from a tree index? Log in, yep, trees. Anytime you see a tree, there's a log somewhere in there. Get tree, log, easy to remember. Okay. So, can we do better? Cricket? Okay. Uh, could we do constant time or constant number of IOs to get a lookup? Yes? Using? Using hashing. So, one class of indexes uh, is, uses trees. There's a completely separate class of indexes that use uh, hash tables. So just a quick recap, uh, since I'm assuming all of you have taken an algorithms class or something similar uh, that has defined hash functions, but just to get it back to the forefront of everyone's memory, a hash function is a function that takes any value and deterministically maps it to a ran uh, something that kind of seems random. It's given an arbitrary data value, it will produce a ran essentially a random number or something that has the same properties as a random number. At least it's unpredictable. But every time I pass it that same object, I'll get back the same random number. So, a hash index basically gives us a random number for any object we care to give it. And we can use that to organize the data into uh, essentially buckets. So what I'm going to describe right now is not an in-memory hash table. I just want to be clear about that. Uh, but the, a lot of the same principles apply. Um, so if I want to store a bunch of records and have them in places where I can easily get to them on disk, um, I can create a bunch of bucket pages, a bunch of uh, pages uh, that act as buckets. And every single time uh, I want to store a record, I compute a hash, I apply a hash function to that record and get back a number. That number is going to fall somewhere uh, between one and a really, really big number. And it's ostensibly random, so I should get roughly a uniform allocation of records to pages. And then I just use that key, uh, excuse me, I just use the uh, record, um, excuse me, the hash value of the record as an index into, the, uh, into this list of pages that I have. So if I want to store a record whose key hashes to 43, I s put it on that page, and then whenever I need to look up the value for key 43, or a key that hashes to 43, I go to page 43 and there is the record, assuming it exists. 
The downside to this, obviously, I could potentially overflow. I could have more data than would fit into a, a single page. So I'll do something kind of like uh, what I do with uh, a, a ISAM index. I'll have these overflow pages. OK. So advantage. What's the, what's the, the lookup and write performance of this, assuming I'm not dealing with overflow pages? constant time. Disadvantage or disadvantages. What are the, uh, why is this not necessarily a great data structure? So as soon as you fill up one page, you start hitting an overflow and well, then you need to start writing to overflow pages, which slows, excuse me, slows you down. Any other disadvantages? Like how would I, uh, could I do a range scan over a data structure like this? I see some people shaking their heads, some people not. Right, so I can't, uh, there's no sorted order in here. The records are stored in essentially a random order. So I can't really do any kind of efficient range scans over this, which is fine. So. The big downside to this is that I have these overflow pages. Now, I can tune the size of the hash table to uh, minimize the number of overflow pages by adjusting the number of actual bucket pages that I have. If I need twice as many, uh, if I have two overflow pages, creating twice as many uh, uh, buckets is going to essentially do what I need. And I can tune my hash, or I can use the modulus, modular arithmetic to basically generate, or I can use the mod operation to construct, a, uh, to have the hash function map to any number of pages I want. So I can basically tune a hash table to be as big as I want, but is that necessarily uh, helpful? Or wh when might that not be a, uh, sufficient? Right. So if I keep adding data, or if the as the data changes, eventually it might turn out that the number that I picked was too small. What happens if I just upfront say uh, I'm going to create five million thousand, five hundred million thousand gajillion uh, hash buckets. All right, so then I actually need to store all of the, the gajillion uh, buckets. And unless you're Google, that's Google or the NSA, that's going to be pretty tricky. So the big problem with this kind of data structure, especially when you go to disk, is resizing. So how expensive, in av on average, would it be to take a, a, a hash table of size n and turn it into a hash table of size 2n? Just naively. So could I do anything more efficient than just copying data from one to the other? little bit of a trick question there. Um, while you can play some games to get uh, to do that in a linear scan, in general the answer is no. Um, copying from one hash table to, if you change the hashing function, typically that's going to involve uh, just co fully rebuilding the hash table. Which basically means if you have a hash table with n records in it, you've just wasted n amount of space. So, right. Which leads us to a couple of additional data structures. So this, this data structure I've just described is called a static hash table. Um, this leads us to a couple of data structures called uh, extendable and linear hashing. And in the interest of time, uh, extendable hashing is far more interesting. So I'm just going to focus on that. 
Uh, if you're interested in other similar data structures, I encourage you either to talk to me directly or uh, check out the, the book, uh, which has, has a nice write-up of linear hashing. So at a high level, the problem is that we want to be able to dynamically resize the hash table as more or less data shows up. So the big problem is we don't want to resize the entire hash table all in one go. What if we had a way to resize individual buckets? To say, OK, this one bucket is full. Now this one bucket becomes two buckets without devolving to something like, uh, to, to something like uh, overflow pages. And so the high level idea is to add a level of indirection. To have, rather than using the hashing function to directly tell us which data page the records are on, to instead have a sort of directory page that has pointers to where all of the records we're looking for are. All right, that's kind of a little bit vague. So let me be a little more precise with an example. I'm going to build a, a directory structure that I can resize uh, however much I want. Um, but this directory structure is just going to be really, really tiny. Uh, it's essentially just going to be an array of integers. One integer per page, or one uh, pointer per page. I'm also going to store a couple of additional values, and these values are going to be, I'll, I'll make them clear in just a moment, uh, a global dimension and a local uh, dimension. The global dimension is going to apply to the entire directory. The local dimension is going to apply uh, one per page. Now the idea is to have each, to look at the individual bits of the hash function. So every bit is a choice, one of two directions, uh, go in one of two directions. And so for four record, uh, if I want to store four paid, uh, a hash table of size four, then I can say, I can have, um, I, I need two bits to convey those four possible values, right? Okay, so I start off with a data structure that looks kind of like this. The directory page contains a set of pointers going to the actual data pages. Now if I want to insert a record into one of these data pages, I'll need to split it. Now what does that mean? Normally, it would mean I'd either need an overflow or, or I'd need to copy the entire table. But what if I just took another bit of the hash function, another bit of, uh, of data generated by the, the hash function? So in this case, bucket A has four records in it. What if I could split those records, just split those more or less evenly in half? Well, in order to do that, I will start by doubling the size of my, uh, of my directory page, or doubling the, the size of the directory array. And again, this is, uh, the directory is just an a array of essentially integers. So doing something like that is pretty cheap, especially since I'm not filling in any of those integers. Anyway, I'll double the size of, oh, excuse me, I am filling. Double the size of the directory array and set up a bunch of pointers so that those pointers are pointing to the same, uh, are pointing to the same bucket based on the first two bits. Uh, so simple example, bucket, uh, excuse me, uh, based on the last two bits. So in this example, bucket B is all of the is pointed to by every page in the directory index that ends in zero one. 
the last two bits of the, the hash function. So 0, 0, 001 points to B and 101 1 points to B. Similarly, 0, 010 0 points to C and 110 1 points to C. And the page that we need to split, well, we'll create a new page and use that extra bit to define which values go into each page. So in this case, um, 32 and 16 both hash to 0, 0, 0 and 4, 12, and 20, both hash, uh, all three of those hash to 1, 0, 0. So I'll create this new page, and now all of my old pages are being pointed to, all, all the pages that didn't need to get split are still being pointed to correctly, so I can still look those up correctly, but the new page is now safely split. All right. That was a bit weird. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. So the... All right. So what we've essentially done here is double the size of the index without copying the data. So remember, the big expensive process here is copying all of the data records. Because if I wanted to double the size of the hash table, I'd essentially need to visit every single page, A, B, C, and D, and reallocate, redistribute those data values to A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime in my new array of size, uh, in my new set of pages of size eight. What I've done instead is to create, is to uh, use this directory table to avoid having to copy all of the data pages. The directory table contains a set of pointers going to the, the pages where data is stored. And all I've done is copy those pointers rather than copying the actual data. So the basic lookup process, if I want to look up a value that hashes to 0, 0, 0, I go to whatever 0, 0, 0, uh, whatever appears in the, uh, I go to whatever page uh, 0, 0, 0 points to. If I want to look up whatever, uh, if I want to look up, let's say, a value 5, I would go to the, uh, the directory and find 0, 0, 001, because that's what 5 hashes to. And then I'd follow that pointer, and that pointer would say, go to page B. And I scan through all of the records in page B, and I find the one uh, that I'm looking for, namely 5. But when I double, yeah. Uh, could you speak up a little? Ah, that's a great question. So why, why do we have two pointers pointing to the same thing? So let me go back a step here. Actually, let me back up, because I think the hashing algorithm, I, ah, OK. So just, as it, just for illustrative purposes, let's use the binary value as the hash. It's not, super uh, not a super interesting hash function, but it makes it very easy to explain, uh, which, in which case 5 actually should have hashed to 101. One. Anyway. Um, so here, I have a two-bit hash function. I take the last two bits of, of my hash function. Um, so 5, the last two bits of that are 0, 1. 1, again, the last two bits, 0, 1. Same holds for 21 and 13. 4, the last two bits are 0, 0. Uh, 12, the last two bits are 0, 0. So if I want to look up uh, 
12, I would go to index 00, 0 and find 12. Now I want to duplicate, I want to double the size of my hash table. And in order to do that, I'm going to need, well, twice as much, twice as many pages. Of course, I don't want to actually copy all of my data pages, so instead I'll, I'll just copy the four, uh, pa the, the four uh, integers I'm using to point to those pages. And I'm also going to give myself an extra bit of hash function to work with. So now 5 hashes to 101, 1 hashes to 001. But by copying the pointers, now both, of the, both 1 and 5 go to the same page. So I can look up both 1 and 5 without having to copy or repartition page B. Meanwhile, page A has to be split, so I'll take everything that hashes to 100, 0, 4, 12, 20 in this example, move that to the new page, and keep everything that hashes to 0, 0, 0, 32 and 16, and keep that on the first page. So using three bits, I can now correctly look up both records that are only indexed by two bits, as well as records that are indexed by three bits. Is that clear? Okay. So, same deal. Uh, yeah. And if I want to split, uh, if I want to do additional insertions now, well, let's say I want to do an insertion into bucket B. Bucket B is only indexed on uh, two bits at this point. And you'll note the local dimension of each page tracks the number of bits being used to index that particular page, whereas the global dimension tracks the number of bits being used to index the index table or the directory table. So now B is only indexed on two bits. The global directory is indexed on three bits, so I can actually split B much more cheaply. All I need to do is update the two pointers for B because my index is already big enough. So I'll do that. I'll create a new page. I'll repartition my data, just the data in B, and I'll update the pointers so that now uh, 101 and 001 point to the right place. All right, any questions? Yeah. One. Ah, good catch. Um, you're correct. I actually, that's, that's today's uh, test to see if you're awake. Um, those two should be flipped. Any other questions? All right. Uh, so the, just to recap, the global depth or excuse me, not dimension, the global depth of the directory uh, tells us how many bits we need uh, to look into the directory, and the local depth of a bucket tells us exactly how many, bucket, uh, how many bits there are indexing the, the uh, keys of that. Um, okay, so if the entire, ideally, the entire directory fits in memory, uh, it is, after all, just one big old uh, array of integers. So we can access potentially uh, things without even having to go to disk for the directory. So there are two issues that arise with this still. And the first is that you need 
the hash function or hash functions are good, but they're not necessarily perfect. And the one case where they really break down is if multiple keys have the same, if you're indexing multiple uh, key attributes that aren't keys in the database sense. Uh, in other words, if the hash table is indexed on an attribute with many duplicate values. So if I have these keys that hash to the same value or that are the same value themselves, we end up with what's called a hash collision. Multiple keys go to the same bucket, and if they all share the same lower bits, which could potentially happen, you might end up creating a very, very deep hash or very large hash table without much uh, benefit. Uh, the advantage of extendable hashing in this case is that you're not actually storing um, actual data pages for all of those uh, buckets. So you can have uh, potentially uh, some efficiency there. OK, uh, deletions are also a little bit tricky because they reduce the size of a hash bucket. But you can use similar trickery to uh, collapse, cl uh, excuse me, collapse buckets together. All right, let's see, how much time do we have? All right, uh, so since this came up on, uh, as a question on Piazza, uh, well, before I get to that, any final question? So this, this is kind of the whirlwind tour of, of indexes. Um, in terms of the project, you won't be required to implement this, but you'll be required to have a understanding of how these indexes work uh, for project two. Um, any questions on the, yes? So the question is, uh, most one typically encounters uh, B plus trees in database systems rather than hash tables. Um, typically, yes. Uh, there are a few cases, especially for very, very large data, where actually I'm barely certain, I'm almost completely certain that the major commercial databases support hash indexes. And I'm almost certain that Postgres does as well. Uh, the reason you will probably, the reason that one typically defaults to a B plus tree is, well, there are a couple of reasons. So first off, what kind of queries can I pose over a tree index? What kind of queries can I pose over a hash index? Or what's, in terms of uh, what I can do with them, what's the difference? Range queries. Um, so tree indexes support range queries, hash indexes do not. So immediately there's a uh, feature penalty by using a hash index. And that's depending on the size of your data How big is a B tree likely to be? Or how many, how many inner nodes, excuse me, how many inner nodes are we likely to see in a hash, in a tree, in a tree index? Hmm? Well, N over two, but the kind of higher levels of the tree tend to be uh, very, very small. So every layer of the tree is uh, a factor of n smaller than the next layer down. So depending on the size of your data, uh, it may be possible to keep most, if not all, of the entire B tree, uh, excuse me, B plus tree in memory. And if you're keeping all of that index in memory, there is very little penalty uh, I mean, IO is your, your bottleneck here. So hash ta the, the, hash, the main benefit of a hash table is that it's a constant number of IOs, or constant time lookup. It's still a cons constant time lookup, but because 
but if you can store the entire B tree in memory, the, the major throughput bottleneck is going to be much lower. So the question is, uh, can't we use something like a bloom filter for hashing? I'm not sure how... So with a hash, with a hash table, I don't have the I/O overhead regardless because I've got my directory. The directory is easily will fit in memory, um, and then I've got my data pages. And so every lookup is just going to be one data page. That's it. Um, a B tree, on the other hand, carries the risk of needing to do a read for all of the non-leaf pages, all of the the, the pages with the pointers. Now, if your design is good enough, uh, or if, excuse me, uh, if you're not dealing with petabytes of data, then a B tree is probably going to be big enough, uh, excuse me, small enough that you can fit in in memory. In which case, in, in both the case of a hash index and the case of a B tree, you have essentially constant, a constant number of IOs to get at any given record. So essentially the, the trade-off here is I'm still doing a constant number of IOs with both data structures, but the B tree also gives me range queries. Now it has that risk of needing to go to disk in some cases, but Again, free, it, uh, the B tree is frequently small enough that that's okay. Yeah. Do we really need to delete from B trees? Depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're organizing data that's being accumulated, if you're the NSA and just data goes in, keeps going in, it never comes out, then no. But if you're doing like a transactional workload, it makes sense to keep your B trees small because you want your transactions to finish fast. Or in, if you're Amazon, for example, you don't want to have uh, every, you don't want to have this growing, growing table of uh, shopping carts. All right, uh, we are out of time. Um, I will put this up on this other bit on Piazza, but basically, uh, quick summary, just, uh, if you have a Boolean formula and you want to uh, split it up, uh, this, since this came up on Piazza, if you want to split it up, uh, there's a two-stage process that we'll go over in, in later depth in one or two lectures uh, where you convert it to conjunctive normal form and then uh, each conjunction acts as a separate condition. Um, We'll cover this in more detail. I'll put a post up on Piazza uh, and see everyone on Wednesday.